Welcome to the What You Need to Know About the NRCME Conference Call. My name is Martin, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Ms. Deb Brisson. Ms. Brisson, you may begin. Thank you, Martin. On behalf of the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, thank you for joining us at the webinar, What You Need to Know About the National Registry of Certified Medical Examiners. We invite you to submit questions during the presentation via the online Q&A tool located in the top menu of your screen. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to our presenter, Dr. Natalie Hartenbaum. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Deb mentioned, what we're going to do is try to take the questions as they come up. I'm seeing them, so please enter them by the Q&A. Um, as much as possible, we'll try to combine questions to get as much material covered as possible. Um, what we're going to do this afternoon is go through what we know so far about the National Registry, primarily focusing on how it's going to affect medical examiners. Um, this comes both from the um, regulation, the material on the National Registry website, as well as several webinars and meetings that the FMCSA has held over the past year plus on the National Registry. So a little bit of background. Um, one of the questions, if you're raising your hand, please don't just raise your hand. Please actually type your question in. It will be um, easier for us to answer that. The National Registry has a bit of a long history going back to 1978 when the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration first did a study on the feasibility of identifying certain medical examiners for those interstate commercial drivers. Um, in 1992, we saw that expansion of who could do the exams to include the licensed healthcare professionals licensed by their state to be able to do examinations. Um, that included the nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, chiropractors, as well as a few other groups. Um, in 1996, the FHWA, um, it was actually FHWA at the time, had a negotiated rulemaking committee that looked at the feasibility of merging the medical certification and the commercial driver's license process. Within that negotiated rulemaking, one of the ideas that, again, was coming up was required training and certification required registering of examiners to be able to not only identify those examiners who had the training, but also as a means to disseminate any updates or information that the agency deems important. Um, in 1999, the Motor Carrier Safety Improvement Act discussed the National Registry, but when that act was signed into law, it was not included. The National Transportation Safety Board had made several recommendations over the years, including in 2001 um, and on their most wanted list in 2003, that there should be a mechanism for medical examiners of commercial motor vehicle operators to be properly trained and certified. Finally, in 2005, Safety LU, the Safe, Accountable, Flexible, Efficient Transportation Equity Act, a legacy for users, was signed. And that act is the basis for this national registry. So basically, the FMCSA, um, in response to the requirements of Safety LU, have um, now put forward finally a final rule on the national registry. In 2005 and 2006, there were several public meetings and listening sessions where the agency um, I solicited input from stakeholders on their concerns and their suggestions on what shape this should take. In 2005 to 2007, there was a role delineation study where there were uh, several hundred examiners who were asked to identify those components of the examination that they felt were essential and essential knowledge that would be required. There were two working integrated product teams for, uh, that they were convened, one on training and one on testing, and through those groups, both the training modules and the testing were pulled together. In 2008, on December 11th, which happened to be the same day, the final rule on merging the medical exam and the commercial driver's license was published, there was a proposed rule on the National Registry of Certified Medical Examiners. Um, the rules look very much like the final rule that was finally published on April 20th this year, um, but there were some changes. And as we go through this next hour, I'll point out those significant differences. If we look back on the National Transportation Safety Board's recommendations, 
that addressed it, the, or the, it's being addressed by the National Registry. Um, the NTSB recommended that the agency develop a comprehensive medical oversight program for interstate commercial drivers that included following program elements, and, and these are the ones that were relevant to the examiners. Basically, that the individuals doing the exams are qualified and educated to do so, that there's a tracking mes mechanism established um, to make certain that every examination is recorded and reviewed, that the certification requirements are periodically updated, and that update is transmitted to examiners, and that individuals performing the examinations have specific guidance and information and a source of um, a resource for questions and information. And then that there is within the process a mechanism to remove the certification from drivers who should not be on the road. Now, I just see a couple of quick questions. One is, yes, the, the, um, this will be available probably uh, by Monday on the ACOM members only website, and I believe when we're finished, Deb will address that. Um, so now as we're looking here, this is what the National Registry's website looks like. If you don't already have this as a link on your a browser, I strongly urge you to do so. As you can see at the bottom, we have circled to join the National Registry mailing list. This is what you want to do. If you're interested in the National Registry, if you want to be a part of the National Registry, if you want to be um, informed when there's changes, go ahead and join that mailing list. There has not been a lot of activity recently, um, but I think as we get closer to the implementation date, there will be a lot of very relevant and, and uh, necessary information um, for the medical examiners. Now, um, the final rule, as I said, was published on April 20th, and what it talks about for the examiners is the examiners are any licensed healthcare provider licensed by their state to perform physical examinations. There was no limiting examiners to MDs or DOs, as has been requested um, by some groups. There was also not a um, waiver from taking the training program for those who are board certified MDs and DOs, who are aviation medical examiners, who are subject matter experts, um, who are certified by specialty organizations. So basically, it's the same category of examiners as had been previously uh, permitted. The difference is that everyone must take the appropriate training and certification requirements. No one is exempted from that training and certification. Um, all the drivers must be examined by a examiner. Now, we're not certifying drivers to certify drivers, but all drivers must be certified by an examiner on the National Registry within 24 months from the effective date, and that would be um, on May 21, 2014. In the proposed rule, there was a phase-in period proposed, smaller carriers um, being able to comply later, larger carriers required to comply earlier. Um, with the final rule, everyone must be in compliance by May 21st, 2012. Um, it's anticipated that approximately 40,000 medical examiners um, will be required. And again, this will be the MDs, DO, nurse practitioner, PAs, chiropractors, whoever is licensed by their state licensing practice act to perform physical examinations. Um, the carriers are, do have a requirement here to ensure that the driver was issued a medical certificate by an examiner on the registry. Uh, there was some concern that the wording may have suggested that the carriers had to do a quality assurance, do a review to make certain that the examiners were doing things the right way. The only requirement is that they make sure that the exams are done by an examiner on the registry. Um, and the States will not be required to cross-check that National Registry number um, with the National Registry database when they're processing those medical certifications. As far as training, um, in the initial proposal, the proposal indicated that they thought that the training could be done within one day. Um, as training programs looked at the proposed uh, or sample training programs, as they looked at the curriculum requirements, there was a great deal of concern that this really was more than a one-day training um, component. And as you can see by this slide, one commenter thought it would actually take five, six, or uh, six-hour days um, to get this all in. While FMCSA did not in the final rule indicate how long training sh could, should be, they did respond the training could be by many different methods. It could be the traditional classroom method. It could be a uh, self-paced distance learning method. It could be a combined method. So there's really a lot of different ways that could address that issue. 
um, for training, the uh, proposal for retraining was that there would be required pre uh, periodic training every three years with every 12 years completion of the initial training as well as recertification. In the final rule, the medical examiner whose certification has not lapsed does need to retrain every five years, but not sooner than every four. Um, and that retraining will be provided by the FMCSA at no charge online. That's the current plan. Um, the recertification will be every 10 years, not sooner than every nine, um, but there will not be a requirement to complete the initial training. So basically, everyone does initial training. You need to do the retraining at five years point, and then a recertification at 10 years without that initial, uh, complete initial retraining although you'll need that periodic training in that second set of years. And I think I missed a slide here. Okay. Um, training programs. Um, the only requirement for a training program is that they're recognized by a national organization to provide CMA. Um, they do not need to be approved by FMCSA, which is a bit different than the testing organizations, and I'll discuss in the next slide. Training organizations only need to be able to grant CMA uh, or continuing education, not CMA, but continuing education units. They then would um, be listed on the FMCSA's website. They would be registered as a training organization, and they then could provide that training. Um, they may but are not required to provide continuing education units as a part of their training. Uh, testing organizations are a bit different in that they not only have to apply to be a testing organization, but must be approved by the FMCSA. Um, the test that will be used is a test prepared by FMCSA. It's uh, been evaluated. It's been agreed upon. We'll talk about the test um, a bit later on. Uh, but the testing could be either in person or online. And in the final rule, there are several very specific criteria um, for um, security and privacy requirements when the test is done remotely. The uh, certification, if you don't pass on your first attempt, you can retake it. We can only take it once um, every 30 days, and you must take it within three years of completing the training. So it uh, you know, can be retaken, but not the next day, the next day, the next day. Once every 30 days is that limit there. Um, there's a significant reporting requirement for the medical examiners once this goes into effect. There will be an online form that examiners must fill out monthly, listing all exams that they've completed, whether the driver passes or not. Um, it would include an identifier for that driver um, as well as the examiner. Um, and I didn't mention that would be um, online. The medical exam has been clarified that the medical examiner must maintain the medical examination report for all the examinations they re uh, per perform. Uh, the proposed rule stated three years. The final rule indicates it must be at least three years, but should be consistent with any state and local requirements for medical record retention. So while you must keep it three, uh, you need to go back and just keep it consistent with any other requirements that you have for any other medical records. Um, examiners can be removed from the National Registry either voluntarily or involuntarily. So if you no longer want to do the examinations, you submit an, a um, request. It's accepted immediately and your name is removed from the listing. However, if you've been issued a notice of proposed removal, you can all of a sudden decide that now I want to volunteer to drop off that process, that proposed removal will continue regardless. Um, and that is the involuntary removal. Um, and we get a very detailed process that goes into place here where you're issued a notice of proposed removal, you're given a chance to appeal, um, and then there's a lot of discussion and decision making. Why were the mistakes made and how have you, uh, why were you, were you really not making mistakes? Um, and then there is a process for emergency removal from an examiner if um, they're significantly out of compliance. Uh, the FMCSA can the reasons that they can remove the individual from the registry is when the ME fails to meet or maintain the qualification standards. So if you haven't taken your training, if you haven't taken your recertification, um, but also if there's significant errors or omissions or improper certifications when the medical exam report and medical examiner certificates are reviewed. Examiners can also be removed um, when they issue a certificate to a driver who does not meet the standards 
or if the examiner somehow doesn't other, um, otherwise comply with the examination requirements. Um, and then obviously if you claim that you completed your training requirements and your certification requirements and haven't, the medical examiner or the, the agency can then again remove you from that national registry. And also in the final rule, there is a new medical examiner certificate that would be required to be used. Um, as we walk through this, the top part isn't all that different. Um, what has changed about halfway down, you see that medical examiner certificate or um, issuing state, and next to it is a national registry number, which you would need to enter on all medical certificates. Um, just below that is a question about interest state only. These forms can be used for drivers who are interest state only, um, and you would check that off and need to ask the examiner or ask the drivers um, whether or not they are. Now, just going to quickly go to a couple of those questions. Um, everybody will need to be certified, whether that's NPs or POs. It is not going to be clinic by clinic, so it is not, you know, clinic in South Street, wherever it might be, it's every examiner within that clinic who is signing the certificate will need to be uh, certified and trained. Um, and chiropractors um, will continue to be allowed to provide the medical certification. And if there's no exams given, you still would need to fill out that form. So I think I've gotten most of the questions ex uh, except some of the specific ACOM ones, which we'll get to in a couple of minutes. Um, one of the things that FMCSA has come out with is the core curriculum specifications. All training programs need to address these various components. How it's addressed, they're not specific on. There is that sample training that is available. Um, we need to talk about the background and rationale and goals of the um, FMCSA's medical examiner, the role in reducing crashes a discussion on the work environment and responsibilities of the commercial motor vehicle operator. Um, how do you identify the driver? What information do you obtain as far as medical history, prescription medication? How do you review and document that medical exam? Um, what diagnostic studies need to be performed? How do you obtain that additional information from treating providers or specialists? Uh, there's a big component as well about making certain that that driver has the understanding, the discussion of what issues might not qualify them next time around, what additional resources that the driver might need to obtain in order to be able to maintain their health. And there's a, a good amount of kind of general health and wellness information included in the medical examiner handbook, uh, which really is going to be the basis for a lot of the training programs on driver uh, essentially maintaining their good health. Um, the training programs need to include how do you determine what the driver should be certified or not, and for how long, and then finally the FMCSA reporting and documentation requirements. Now this slide was presented at a webinar several months ago, kind of walks you all the way through the process from the registry to taking the test. And what the exact candidate uh, would do is first visit the National Registry website, identify where they can do um, testing. They've already done the training at this point. Um, they schedule the test, they go and take the exam, and then the candidate presents that information to the testing center with documentation and proof that they've already completed that training requirement. And then they go take the test. The information is sent from the test center to FMCSA and at the same time notifies the individual if they've passed that test or not. Um, originally, it was anticipated that the, the examiner could take the, exa the training, take the test, get that outcome all at the same time. Not sure it's going to actually end up happening when you're looking at this current process. So it may be more of a two-step process than a take your training, take your testing, get your certification ready to go all at once. Um, some of the responses from the training and certification webinars, a reminder that the training organizations will not be approved or credentialed, but the testing organizations will be. Um, the expectation is that with online testing available, the testing will be available essentially daily. Um, one of the questions already is addressed that every provider in a medical group will need to be trained and certified, so if the PA or nurse practitioner is doing the exams and signing the form, they need to be the ones having that training. Um, what's important and is emphasized in the medical examiner handbook that even though you as an examiner or the physician may have someone else doing components of that exam, 
if you're the one signing it, you're ultimately responsible for anything that's on that form. Um, and that includes vision, hearing, um, any other ancillary tests. Likewise, if you're signing off on that nurse practitioner or PA, um, you should be the ones doing the exam, not them. Um, the medical examiner is in the process of being updated. Um, at that webinar, it was mentioned that the expectation that this was that the entire handbook would go out for public comment once it was completed. Right now, it is not fully downloadable as a single document. You would need to kind of do a lot of linking and going back and forth and opening additional pages. Um, but the hope is eventually that would be available as a complete download. Um, as far as fees, and this was addressed in multiple places, both training and testing organizations can set their own fees. There is no ceiling, there is no cap on fees, um, and neither testing nor training organizations will receive any type of reimbursement or compensation from FMCSA. The training organizations will need to provide all participants who have completed the training program with some type of certificate or documentation of completion, but there is no specific wording required um, for the training program. Um, while you can perform medical examinations on drivers who may have their CDL in any state, you may only perform the medical examinations in the state in which you are currently licensed. So if you're licensed in Pennsylvania, you can perform exams in Pennsylvania. But I can examine a driver from Ohio, West Virginia, California, or any other state. Um, the requirements, again, of the medical examiner, remembering to submit that form, the MCSA 5850, every month, whether or not exams were performed. Um, you must maintain that original copy of the medical exam report, and either a copy or electronic version of the certificate for at least three years. Um, medical examiners will be required to submit to periodic audits. Um, and submit their documentation, their paperwork for review, and then provide the FMCSA with any information as requested. Um, they need to be, can you be licensed, registered, or certified in accordance with not just the FMCSA's national registry requirements, but also their state requirements. So if you lose your state license to practice, um, you lose your ability to perform these medical examinations. Examiners will also need to submit any changes um, in their information, their locations, et cetera, to FMCSA, and will need to report to FMCSA if they've had any change in their state licensure, and then maintain all that documentation um, of their state licensure. Um, one of the thoughts and questions very early on was that could a training and testing organization, um, could, could they do both? And there are some frequently asked questions available now on the National Registry's website pertaining to the National Registry, and one of those is that the training and testing organizations cannot be the same. You can't have one group tra uh, training and then turning around and testing on what they've trained. So um, there is that protect protection of the conflict of interest issues. And then uh, the medical examiner candidate is required to pay any fees. It's, again, not an FMCSA that pays for it and does not establish training or testing fees. I'm going to jump over now to a few of the questions. Um, and you know, I'm going to go to some of the questions. One of the questions is it possible for an ME to have two national registry numbers, one for work performed on behalf of an employer and one they perform independently. Um, I have not seen it anywhere. What I will do is gather these questions and submit them to FMCSA so that we can have those questions answered in the future. Um, is there a time when the driver certification when the driver certification may not be able to be given initially if the examining physician needs to get the additional information? Absolutely. Um, the expectation is that there will be situations where the examination is done. The examiner needs additional information, and we'll have that examination on hold. One of the things that has not been addressed yet is what do you do with an incomplete exam? Is there a point at which you determine an exam is incomplete, is therefore a not pass or disqualify, or however that needs to be worded? Uh, we want to make certain that we don't have um, exam drivers who choose to not go, um, not complete the exam in examiner A because examiner A is requiring additional information and then just go to a different examiner, get the second exam, which may be a pass, 
and that the first exam kind of gets lost. So that is one of the questions that will be submitted. Um, as far as online testing, that's really up to the testing organizations for the certification. Um, the testing organizations have not yet been announced, and as we go to the next couple of slides, um, we'll talk about that. So where the testing can be done, whether it's going to be at a testing center or in the physician's office, that has not been um, announced yet. I'm going to go back to some of the slides, and then we'll go finish some more questions. I think some of the ones I have um, are already in the later slides. We have the schedule. Um, the publication date of the rule was April 20th, 2012. And at this point, the training organizations are already, if they haven't, developing their curriculum to meet those requirements. And ACOM has been certainly working on updating our current course to meet the training requirements. We can start offering training. Um, the training organizations can start offering that training whenever they're ready. And uh, it's supposed to be an administrative manual for testing organizations on the website. When I last checked a couple of days ago, that was not yet available. On May 21st, the National Registry is actually available online for training organizations to start listing that they're out, that, that, to register that they're available to offer training. So four days from now, um, the training organizations will start being listed. At that same time, medical examiners can go on the website, find those organizations that offer testing, um, and then um, go ahead and, and begin to take the testing programs once they're able to test. Four months after the publication date on August 20th is when the medical examiners can start registering. So right now, as an examiner, you can't even get on the registry until August 20th. Um, you can register. You can then take the certification exam after you're registered. And then once you're past the exam, you'd be listed on that national registry. And then beginning at that point, both the exam, the drivers and the carriers can search for certified um, medical examiners. Uh, and the key important date is going to be May 21st, 2014, when all medical examiners who wish can, to conduct those examinations um, must be trained, must be certified. Um, and drivers who are seeking that examination must use a driver on the registry. Now, what's the, the question that keeps coming up is, what happens to the driver who goes in for their examination on May 20th, 2014, to an examiner that is not on the registry? Their examination is valid. It's fine through that expiration date. The next one, though, has to be done by an examiner on the registry. Um, AACOM in the National Registry, uh, as Deborah and I were discussing before we formally began this webinar, we are frantically updating our current course. Um, there will be several different components to it. Um, it will definitely meet the training requirements. Um, we already have three dates set, July 20th in Chicago, um, planning to open registration for that on Monday or Tuesday, September 28th in Philadelphia, November 9th in Atlanta, and then early 2013 um, on the West Coast. And then we'll be adding additional dates as we see what's going on. Um, we're also in the process of developing a distance learning module, modular training program, um, probably through webinars. Um, we're planning to have the first module available in August of this year, shortly after you can start registering um, as a, a, a medical examiner on the National Registry, and hoping to have all of the component modules available very shortly after that August 20, um, 2012 date. So within the following three months, um, that will be available. Um, we recognize that many of you have taken the ACOM courses in the past, in past several years. Uh, there's been a lot of changes, um, not as many over the past two years, which is why we're looking at that two year as the cutoff. Um, what we will be doing is making some arrangements where there will be um, an opportunity for you to take the current training program, um, the, the distance learning program, at a significant discount. Uh, the reason for that is that the old courses did not cover all the required material uh, that's in the FMCSA's core curriculum, um, but much of the material has been covered. So we're going to be kind of balancing out the what you've already had versus what you still will need. Um, so that's the current plan, and, and you know, keep an eye on the ACOM um, newsletters and emails to, to see exactly where we're going on that. Now, from a little bit of a um, editorial comment. The training and examinations will be focusing on the minimal medical standards. The training programs may but are not required to include things such as the medical expert panels, the medical review boards, and other medical literature. So the testing will focus on what's in the 
medical examiner handbook, the frequently asked questions, whatever has been approved and accepted by FMCSA. But again, the training programs can and they come, will to some extent include other relevant information. Um, the challenge with that will be is what will become best practices because the training um, will differ um, when it goes beyond just that minimal medical standard. Um, and I think that the question about best practices may lead to some liability issues both from the ADA and from a crash perspective. Um, the next slide is just kind of a reminder and an overview slide once again of the National Registry's website. You know, please make sure that you do um, bookmark this. You'll have a link to that. Um, on the left-hand side is your resource center, medical examiner handbook. That's pretty much everything you need to know. Um, the frequently asked questions, and I think need to know to differentiate that from should know. Um, I'm certainly very biased and feel it's in, very important for the examiners to not just understand that minimal medical standards, but understand what current best medical practices should be as well, which is looking into some of the other more recent information. Um, the resource center includes the frequently asked questions. On the right-hand side, again, I've circled that join the National Registry mailing list. Can't urge enough times how important that is. Um, above that, you have um, the testing and tra uh, training webinars, sample training, core curriculum guidance. Um, as well as training organization manual in the final world, which has not was not available when I last looked. Um, I suspect it probably will be by the time we finish this um, webinar. And then the final slide I'll leave up there is the National Registry's website, as well as the phone number that you may have for any questions. So now I'm going to go through the questions that had come up. Um, monthly reporting does not include drug testing. That is only the examination. The, month, the drug testing has been and will continue to be separate from the medical certification. Um, if you do no exams in a given month, you still will need to submit. And again, the form will be the driver's name, driver's information, your name, your um, registry information, um, whether the driver is qualified or not, and how long they're qualified for. Um, the test, the way, and I somehow managed to skip that slide, the test, Maybe I did not include that slide. Um, the test will be a um, hundred questions. It was developed by the working integrated product teams. Basically, if every um, participant on that team agreed that the question was a necessary component, necessary knowledge, it went on the test. Um, the expectation, according to one of the webinars, is that if you've attended the training program, if the training program has covered the required material, you should be able to pass the test. Um, The questions for the test are being set by FMCSA. They have a pool, as I mentioned, 100 questions will be on each exam. Um, they will be counted and scored. There, um, at least in the early webinars, was indicated to be an additional 20 questions that would not be scored but would be evaluated for performance to be put on future tests. Um, questions of requirements versus recommendations, nothing's really changed. Um, the regulations are what you have to follow, the recommendations from the FMCSA or what you should be following, unless there's a very strong reason not to. Um, and in the handbook, it emphasizes that you would need to document why you're not um, following them. Um, the slides for these, again, will be available. ACOM is offering the training. ACOM will not be offering the testing. Um, the FMCSA has indicated the training and testing organizations should be separate. So. Um, you have to look at two different listings to see where you can take your training and then where you can take your testing. The uh, employer, the carrier is required to keep records of the driver's qualification um, in their driver's qualification file. When the commercial driver's license was kind of merged with the medical certificate in most cases, um, and then we go into a weight issue of the vehicle, the driver takes their qualification to their state driver's licensing agency. That's entered into their commercial driver's licensing information system data, and then the carrier, the employer, can look up the medical certification through that database. So that would be how the carrier would um, maintain records that the driver is medically qualified. Uh, clarify requirements that 
after uh, May 21st, 2014, if you are not on the national registry, you may not perform a commercial driver medical examination. If you do, um, the examination is not valid. So all drivers must be examined by someone on the registry as of that date. Um, if the NP or PA does the exam, um, the physician must repeat the exam and sign the certificate with a question. Whoever does the exam, if their state license permits them to do the exam, they may sign it. They must be on the registry. If the physician is um, doing the exam, then the physician should sign the examination. Um, and the co-signing is really a state-by-state -state issue. Um, a residency training uh, that comes to each residency program. Some residency programs um, may incorporate that training as part of their residency training. Um, the question is that we have a course in Chicago in July. The current plan um, for the ACOM training, at least for the in-person, more traditional training, is it will be one day. Um, it will be essentially modular that we're trying to make sure we cover all the same material in both the distance learning and in-person didactic traditional session. Um, but there will be a lot of pre- and post-reads. Um, in going through the required curriculum and going through the handbook and going through pretty much everything, um, the faculty, the course directors, uh, ACOM staff, we recognize that there's a lot of material that you know, how do you examine eyes? How do you examine lungs? Why, what is aortic stenosis? What is congestive heart failure? Which we're taking the approach that the examiners need to have already had that information as part of their training, whether it's a PA, nurse practitioner, MDDO, or whatever that might be. We're collating that as well as some of the relationships to driving and some of the background information and putting that is a, in what we're calling a pre-read package. That will be a self based learning component before you come to the one-day course, and then in order to be fully prepared for your test, we're going to be giving you some post uh, material as well that you'll need to read. So we're trying to really make this as um, accessible to as many people as possible, keeping it to a one-day training program. Um, right now we're actually planning on it from 7.30 to 4, so you can come in the night before and hopefully get a flight home that same night, um, and we'll probably be consistent uh, with all of the in-person training programs. Um, but then there will be that pre and post information. Um, the question, next question is about the city county bus drivers. Um, depends on your state. If your state is requiring the drivers of certain groups to meet the interstate, the federal motor carrier safety regulations, for those interstate drivers, you can still do the examination. And when I showed you the certificate, you would just check off interstate only. Uh, keep in mind, Requiring a driver to meet federal medical standards when they are not required to meet federal medical standards, whether it's because they're driving interstate or because their state requires it, um, could be a problem um, from an ADA perspective. So if the state's requiring it, that's fine. If the employers say, I want them to meet, you know, FMCSA requirements, um, they need to talk to their lawyer. Um, will there be MOC credit with ACOM distance learning training? There definitely will be CME. I expect we'll do MOC. We do MOC with almost everything. Um, will only ACOM members be able to take the ACOM training? No, we will welcome anyone who would like to take our training. Um, we are gearing it toward um, those who have at least a basic understanding, which is why we have that pre-read, post-read, and then we'll have other materials available as well. So anyone is eligible um, to take the course. Um, employer is not responsible for paying for anything. Um, and I'm not sure whether you meant carrier, truck, uh, driving driver's company, or your employer, i.e., if you work for Concentra, uh, are they going to be paying for it? There's nothing in the regulation over who pays for the training, who pays for the testing. Yeah, California just updated their medical certificate. Um, they're going to, for the interstate, you're going to need to be using the new medical certificate. The question on pending information, um, that will be addressed to the FMCSA. Uh, I don't think that was very well addressed in the um, rulemaking. At the AOHC meeting this past 
or earlier this month, um, Dr. Benice Lester, who's Chief Medical Officer of FMCSA, indicated that there will be a National Registry Rule Part 2 coming out, which will clarify some of those hanging out there questions. So that's one that hopefully um, will be addressed. Um, It says that the um, website www.nrc.fmcsa is not correct. Um, I'll go back and double check that. The um, individual noted that you don't have to put the www um, up front. The requirements for becoming an accredited training organization. There is not an accredited training organization. Any organization can offer training if they are um, a, a group that can provide CA continuing education through a national um, approved organization. So if you can give CME, if you can give CEUs, if you can give other um, continuing education units, then you can be a training organization um, for this process. Um, if you refer to a cardiologist or specialist as part of your examination process, must that specialist be certified? No, because the, certi the specialist is not the one making the final determination. When you refer a driver to a specialist for additional information, for additional testing, um, you can take that recommendation from the specialist, um, but you're the one making that final determination, which is why, at least for the ACOM courses, we say, get the data, show me the data. Um, just to say he's stable, he's okay, um, I know I want to see what that ejection fraction is or what the stress test results are actually showing to make certain that that driver does meet FMCSA requirements. Um, there's a number of organizations that have um, are out there doing training and doing certification and doing testing. Um, if you, you know, the the tri testing must be done through the FMCSA's National Registry Training, so previous testing. So previous testing does not meet the requirement of this um, rulemaking. And I think those were the questions. General cost of the medical examination, um, there's no set cost. There was a question about capping out the cost on the final rule. Agency indicated they're not going to cap out the cost. Um, there is not an Excel version you know, that I'm aware of. There is a the certificate that's published in the Federal Register, and you can download it or change it however you'd like to. Um, can a resident in a residency program take the test and certificate? Absolutely, as long as they are licensed by, this, by a state to do um, medical examinations. And please comment on general driver awareness of these matters and their roles in seeing that medical matters needing to be addressed um, are addressed. A lot of this is really being pushed off to the examiner. So in addition to, be, to discussing with the driver the medication issues, the safety and risks of medications, the examiner is also expected now to discuss with the driver any medical condition that may impact their safety, which may impact their future certification. I see people who are raising your hand rather than raising your hand. Please just type your question in. Um, the new certification card is available online now, so you can use it or you cannot use it. But, you know, you really doesn't make much sense using it before August 14th or until you're certified. Uh, monthly reporting requirements, again, do not include drug testing. The monthly report is... Um, on a monthly basis, it's sent in, and I'm looking here, and I think got most of the questions. Um, how long can you wait for a specialist information to come in before a new exam must be done? That's one of those questions that we need to have addressed, is how long can an incomplete examination be held out there? Um, back with the... Um, negotiated rulemaking committee, there was a suggestion of 15 days, um, but there was nothing that's really specified by any rule right now. 
if the driver has multiple medical problems, I wonder if employers should tell drivers to bring as much information to the driver's physical as possible. Um, you know, the question about the MRO, again, please keep in mind, MRO is separate from this medical examination process. There are two separate issues, the drug testing and the medical certification. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that telling drivers who have any kind of medical conditions to bring information to their examination can only help expedite the process. So if you're doing an exam and you know your driver's coming back in one year for recertification, tell them what to bring with them. It'll just make life a lot easier next time around. Okay, any other questions? Um, again, I see people who are raising their hands. Um, is the monthly reporting form currently available? No, that's not currently available. Examiners are not registered. They can't be registered until August of this year. Um, so at this point, there is no reporting requirement. Requirements for reporting will begin after you're on the registry. That was a, you know, current sense. Um, and reporting when this is required, grace period. Kind of going back over the timeline one more time. Right now, testing and training organizations are registering. Um, we can pull these slides back up so it'll be easier. Okay. The registry will be available online. Training organizations can note when they're ready to give training. So as an examiner, you can go choose a training organization and take your and go ahead and take the training. At the same time, testing organizations can apply to be an approved testing organization. Once they're approved, they will be placed on that listing, and then examiners can go ahead and take that. Um, well, they can't really until they can register, because in August is when the examiners can first register. And then from the registry, then they can go ahead and take that testing. So if the training can be done first, the testing has to be um, done once the examiners can register. So that's that magic starting date is August 14th. And I'm going to go back to some of the questions. Um, one person is retired, asked to cover clinics sporadically, been doing these exams. Um, if you're doing one exam a month, you need to be medically certified. If you're doing medic medical exams, one exam a year, you need to be certified. There was discussion on the um, cost associated with training and testing, and, you know, it kind of went through the more exams you do, the more cost effective it is. And I think part of the idea um, behind this is an examiner that does one exam every six months is not going to understand the details and the intricacies of this process. So the more exams you do, the more cost effective it is to be trained. But unless you're trained, unless you're certified, unless you're on that national registry, um, you can't do an exam after August 21st, 2014. Um, if the driver can't afford to see a specialist, then that's a real separate issue. Your issue as a medical examiner is that unless that person meets the medical qualification standards, to your satisfaction, is able to do the job safely, then you cannot sign that medical certificate. Whether or not they have an outside provider, whether or not they see the specialist, um, that's really not necessarily the issue that you need to take into account. Certainly, want to try to get the drivers to medical care. But as an examiner, you have to make the decision as to whether or not they meet those criteria and whether or not they can be qualified. Uh, reporting requirement, it is um, a form where the medical examiner on a monthly basis gives a list of all the examinations they've completed in the preceding month and the date of expiration and submits that to FMCSA who will then review that. There are question about the space for I'm putting the slide back up again. Um, on the certificate, there's a space for CDL, yes, no, is whether or not the person has the CDL when it comes to intrastate only. Um, there are some drivers who are not required to have a CDL by their state if they're operating intrastate only. It's a complicated issue, but, you know, if the driver has a CDL, you check it off if he doesn't have a CDL. Um, you don't have to check it off. Again, interstate and interstate requirements can be a bit different. 
Um, the presentation will be online available if you're interested. And Wait a couple more minutes for any other questions to come in. Can clinic or support staff complete the online reporting form on behalf of the provider? As detailed instructions for that have not yet been published, I don't want to venture a guess. My suspicion is that um, they can fill the form out. They're not really certifying the driver. For all they're doing is a data entry of what examination has been done. Um, again, slides for this will be available through the, FM, through the ACOMS members only website um, shortly after we're done. If you give a three month certific certific certification, you do an exam and then you recertify a driver three months later, you put that name back on that um, reporting form. So they have that extension available. Can examiners access prior driver certificates? Some drivers fail to remember um, their sending or other medical information. Right now, um, there is no database for um, previous examinations. Okay. All right, Deb, I'm going to, I guess the final question is, can the medical examiner uh, certificate be formatted? Right now, both the medical examiner certificate and the medical examination reporting form um, do not need to look exactly as they look in the Federal Register and the Code of Federal Regulations. They must be substantially in accordance with, which means they must have the same information. So if I'm going to turn this over to you. Sure. Thank you again, Dr. Hartenbaum, for organizing all this important information for us today. And uh, this webinar will be available actually on our public area of the website under the CDME Knowledge Center uh, beginning Monday, if not sooner. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. And uh, we shall have registration information out for our training opportunities very soon. So stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.